Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is The Other Thing I Do. My guest this week is Ian Carpenter, a writer and producer whose credits include Being Erica, Played, Unspeakable, Frankie Drake Mysteries, and showrunning Slasher, which is currently playing out its fifth season, Ripper, on Shudder. It's a very fun show, even with all the murdering, or maybe because of it, and you should check it out. Ian's also written three features with slasher creator Aaron Martin, Terror Train, Terror Train 2, and the brand new Mary F. Kill, which just dropped on Tubi in the U.S. and Craven Canada. Ian picked Gummo, the 1997 directorial debut of Harmony Corinne, whose screenplay for Larry Clark's Kids vaulted him to indie superstardom a couple years earlier. Also made on a shoestring, Gummo is just as fascinated with nihilistic adolescent behavior and stunted social development as Kids was, setting itself in an Ohio town devastated by a tornado where there's nothing to do but kill cats and get high, and not necessarily in that order. And if that doesn't sound like the most enthusiastic endorsement of the film, well, yeah, we talk about that. This is someone else's movie. Well, it was just an enormous movie for me. I mean, I saw it in in 97. Um, I was at U of T. I was, I'm trying to think whereabouts I was. I think I was doing my PhD by that point in film at U of T. And... Uh, and I was a, a, a playwright and a director in theater. Um, and I don't know, that movie came out. I saw it at uh, TIFF back when possibly it was called the Festival of Festivals. Um, I worked at uh, TIFF. You probably did too. No, um, no, I'm no? the only one I know who didn't. Oh, wow. Some okay. capacity. Everybody's like, they were in print traffic or they were in the box office or they were I volunteer. Was, yeah, I did box office and I did print traffic. And um, and I think I did, I think I was doing print traffic for this, which was great because you had this pass that could let you in some ways sneak into movies, um, like jump lines and things like that for things that were super popular. Anyway, I remember seeing it, seeing the first screening, losing my mind, telling all my friends, many of whom are in the business now, like, you have to see this. And I must have said it so vehemently, and we were all just so such passionate attendees that everyone went. Everyone was thrilled by it. So I went to the screening, I think, the next day. And I don't think I was hip enough to go to industry screenings, or I don't think I was even aware of them at the time. I'm not sure. But um, and it just it just riveted me. It just sort of burned into me. And I've always been um fascinated, not not by myself, but fascinated that for a writer um, who writes, you know, more traditional material that I would love a film that is so untraditional and on the writing front. So, so scattered, so montage so editing focus, so reality, uh, you know, do we swear averse. on this podcast? Yeah. Yes. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Reality averse is the cleaner we, way to say it. Yeah. But we can swear if you want to. Sure. Sure. So it, it, um, it was all that and it just electrified me and it and there is something about it felt it felt very real and very personal to me and there's and and, and I've always puzzled about this you know by myself like I I grew up in Brampton so to me fair that's pretty middle class but I will say when I was there it felt very working class um you know so this would be like the 70s and stuff like that when I would get you know jobs as a young teenager and things like that and so so you were just you know, like I, I felt like it wasn't it wasn't marred by the kind of poverty that Corinne is showing in that movie. But I feel like I know a ton of those people and I feel like I had a ton of those very strange, riveting moments. Like there's something about that that feels it feels very um, a child's vision or something like that of things, things that you stumble upon on, you know, in abandoned industrial areas or rail yards or someone who's very different from you uh, whose house you show up at or you know all that kind of stuff and also to the some of the sort of shocks in the movie feel like things that I went through as well where you you know you 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 get a new best friend and hang out with them nonstop for 6 weeks and then they would tell you something or show you something horrible that you'd suddenly go Oh my God, like this was, you know, I, th- I thought we were going to be best friends forever. And you've just told me the most awful thing that will end this friendship forever. And, um, and it's normal to you. And it's, so I feel like all of that just kind of jangled around inside of me and just, you know, it was a massive yes. And, 
and it was amazing to rewatch it. Um, it, it. I had a rule with this movie that I would only see it projected. So I think I've seen it four times, maybe five. Okay. Um, I, it, it was the last movie I saw at the Paradise. I think the Paradise closed a week later. Um, and, and, and it was amazing knowing I haven't seen it for, I don't know, 12 or 13 years or something like that, to sit down and go, wow, I can't believe how, how much I know every second of it or just every little facial expression of every character, which when you consider how much that movie is a barrage of clips, often disconnected, people you never meet again or see again. It's just some little kid flexing his muscles at the camera for 20 seconds, and then he's gone, never to be seen again. And all these things I remember, and then even like just to think about that little boy flexing his muscles, I remember his eyebrows. I remember him, his bravado as he starts. I remember his doubt as it continues. I, you know, and it's all just kind of uh burned in there um yeah so i don't know that that's 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 why you know it was so important to me in ways i can't understand but uh and i and i feel like it it taught me a lot about you know editing and music i mean i found the cinematography just incredibly gorgeous i loved i don't know how to pronounce his his last name escoffier but um i think yeah jean yves escoffier yeah, I mean, I, I was a huge fan of uh, Les Amants de Pont Neuf. That was a massive movie for me. And so it made so much sense that he was leaping to here. And, um, and I, you know, I just, even with the sort of rough beauty of it all, I found the, the look of it so gorgeous. And yeah, but, um, but that's a lot of me talking about this. And, and I expected when you, when you and I talked, I mean, I feel like this should be on the podcast. You were like, sure. yeah, 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 let's do it. Let's do it. I guess I'll have to watch. I don't know what you're, what, what you said. I guess I'll have to watch Gummo again, clearly <laughs> hating it. And we'll go ahead. I don't want to put words in your mouth. But, no, no, but, no. And, and then I said, oh, good, good. Okay. And I was expecting, I was like, okay, I'll come. I know you prepare. I'm going to prepare too. And to me, we were going to have a battle. Um, right here, where I was going to tell you why this was great. You were going to tell me why it was terrible. And um, and we'd get somewhere. Uh, you know, of course, I thought I would win. Um, uh, but I don't think that anymore. So I was like, I feel like I feel like I'm uh, I'm arriving uh, for my own bloodbath. So, Norm, talk to me. <laughs> but that's not what we do. That's not what I, I, know, I do. I know it's not. I know it's not. It's about understanding why you like something or even don't like something anymore if you've if you've changed your perspective on it or something has changed i do hate it i think um <laughs> i remember i saw it in the basement of the famous players building uh on university avenue a long gone cool. screening room which was not the best place because it was the screen was too small to be fully overwhelming and i think that cool probably helps when you see this one for the first time that you need to be assaulted by it yeah. and it was a smallish screen probably smaller than the one I have now. Oh, no. And um, it was unimpressive. It just, it felt like I was not a huge fan of, of the movie Kids, yep. uh, which felt very much like Larry Clark using the moment as an excuse to make basically the 1990s version of Reefer Madness. Like it's <laughs> just, it's just such a, it's such a, a heightened and pearl clutching moralistic film even though it doesn't think it is and a lot of people just love the rawness of it and and mm -hmm. absolutely for you know skate culture and all that there was the first time these kids had seen themselves represented mm -hmm. on a screen or in popular culture in anything other than the you know the gap ads that were happening right around the same time mm -hmm. and i understand that film's cultural impact and then corinne went off and made this and I was not surprised by it. It just, it felt like, and what was I, 29, I guess, in 97. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just already the jaded, uh, you know, film, film esthete going, oh, this is not cinema. It is, it is a movie, like it is, it is cinema, but yeah. it has no organizing principle that I can respect. And it does mm -hmm. feel like disaster tourism in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, I think that, I think Corinne has, 
and this applies to most of his other movies too, as it's played out, I think he usually has one or two really compelling ideas when he starts a script and then just fills it with space. And mm -hmm. the space mm -hmm. is the thing that I find least interesting. And because it's, it's a kind of, it's actually when you were talking about when, um, when you were talking about the experience of being a kid and not having any reference for your own world outside yourself. Yeah. And being startled or shocked by the way other people live their lives, even if they live, you know, just not necessarily worse or better, but just differently. Yeah. I think that's Corinne's go to, but he tries to make them shocking. He tries to make it startling and, and tilts immediately into the absurd. And, you know, the uh, Solomon in the bathtub is the perfect example of this. And it was the still that sold the movie around the world. Oh, and it was, it's, it's the image that people think of when they think of Gummo. And it's just, it's, it's really nifty. You know, like it's never been, you've never seen it before. You've never seen this level of squalor, which is the way Corinne oh. wants you to see it. I mean, there's mm -hmm. filth on the walls and they're, they're, he's surrounded there's, by. You can bacon, say bacon, bacon taped to the wall. Carry on. Yeah, but it is. It's it's like a it's like a circus version. It's the it's a P.T. Barnum version of of poverty or squalor. He's uh -huh. there's nothing well, in it that feels real to me for a second. It's well, just he'd, he'd, all artifice. He'd probably like the P.T. Barnum uh, of it, given all the bizarre slapstick stuff that's in there and the oh, sure. ho the hokey stand up that the one character uh, talks about. You know that is very interesting. Like it like. <clears throat> I I struggle with this and and wonder it especially wonder about it especially now that I work so much in horror you know I'm often reading things just recently read Tender as the Flesh great new novel about cannibalism um in the future uh which is sort of a buzzy thing uh right now and and some other books around it where I sit there and I go sometimes I feel sort of the way I feel like you're 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 feeling where uh, for me, what I'm saying about the creator is I sit there and I go, oh, okay, you're you're trying so hard. You're trying so hard to be bad, to be edgy, to be repellent, to pick pick your thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm very curious about this because I know that's been leveled at at my work as a theater practitioner, sometimes as a you know, as someone who makes TV or movies, and you know, and and there's you know, there's times where people in my life like Adam McDonald, the director of the last three seasons of Slasher, you know, there were some in season three, there was a scene where two, two men had their faces glued together um, for, for reason, for, sure. for very good reasons. There's always and, a reason. Uh, yeah. And, and he came walking out of the, the little basement dungeon we'd put them in, shaking his head and looking at me and going, <laughs> so, saying something like only you, only you, <laughs> you know? And I, and I, um, so I, I, I sit there and I go, it, well, this is so strange how we, we fall on these sort of um, gradations of like, you know, so, someone who's a little over top of me, I'm like, oh, give me a break. You're, you're ridiculous. Um, someone who's below, I'm probably like, this isn't, this isn't enough. And, and also too, just like how those things resonate is real. Like going back to the childhood thing mm -hmm. and being a, a teenager in Brampton, I think of, you know, when I saw Blue Velvet, which I saw at the Carlton and reading review and going, I have to go. And, and didn't know anything about it and dragged all my friends. And we went and I showed up and I went, holy shit, like this is me. What part of it is me? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully no part of it. But I was like, it was a moment where I went, oh, I'm not so weird. I thought I was so unusual the way I see and feel the world. And so I feel that with with Gummo, where I was like, there's a way in which there's a resonance here where I'm like, this is how I feel it. It's it's more extreme than I feel it, but it makes it makes so much sense to me. You know, it just it just connects to me so much. And I, and I but I 100 percent get you, anyone else the way they might feel about the film, the way they might feel about the, some of the things I've made. It's, it's, um, I don't, I don't know what we do about that. And why, why do certain things that are far more, um, uh, far more mainstream or commercial or whatever nauseate me and make me feel like, um, I'm like, Oh, this is so phony, you know, you know, but I, it's not like I don't also love those things. And, you know, 
a, a, a stage musical can bring me to tears and and make me if I'm stumbling with creation the solve is always a stage musical. Like, I'm just like, I think maybe I'm, d- I'm done. I d- don't like what we do. Da, 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 da. Then I go see a couple of those things and I'm like, Oh my God, this is so pure. Um, and it just revitalizes me and cures me of all those things. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about all of this. I don't just dis- like, again, I don't disagree with anything that you've said. I, I think it's actually kind of the, the key to, to, collective not shared narratives but collected narratives where we all plug into something you know 600 people in a room will have the same experience and all come away with separate interpretations and come out changed or even if just angry that's still a change in your state right like it's still affected you in some way and the experience of gummo is so specific because if you key into any one thing you'll embrace some part of it and defend it. Uh, a critic at the time was insisting that the whole thing was some sort of work of veiled genius and, and deliberate allegory, uh, although he never managed to explain what the allegory was because Tumblr is named Tumblr and Tumblr is Yiddish for, you know, sort of jokester, prankster, fool, mm-hmm. someone who just won't leave you alone and is annoying. Mm-hmm. And that to him was the key to the whole movie, but it doesn't unlock anything. Um, because he couldn't actually explain how it unlocked anything or what it revealed. It's just that his thing was, he was clinging to the idea that Corinne's choice of name is obviously proof that he's operating on some level that the film has yet to reveal. And I have absolutely seen movies like that, um, where there is a lexicon, there is a language that I don't speak, and the film will give you glimpses of it, or the creator will teach you how to speak that language by the end of the movie. Gummo just felt to me like he was encouraging us to point and stare. And Mm. then in Julian Donkey Boy, he tries something a little more mature, which is a, it is a relationship picture, if nothing else, that it's a story about connection. Um, And with Gummo, it's just this unfixed, um, unfocused travelogue to me of Mm -hmm. all these things that I could care about if I was given opportunity insight yeah. reason yeah. and instead you're just left to gop at people and then there are elements that i think now play as more interesting than they were at the time the um the drag material the right. trans stuff that's just floating around because i don't think corinne knew how to how to tell it in any way that made sense within the film but also to the characters and that's the point right like this is the way these kids these unfinished humans relate to people that they can't relate to, which is to just wall them off in a way. And that I think is the most interesting thing about the film now is what it says about our collective inability to accept one another if we're not educated or enlightened or warm or empathetic enough. But I still don't feel the connection to the characters that I need to enjoy the movie, if that makes sense, or to at least appreciate it. Totally. Uh, well, it's interesting because that would that would uh, describe how I felt about um, just that last part about uh, Julian. Uh, oh yeah. And uh, and what was the the movie after that where the impersonators all went to an island with Michael Jackson? And Michael, Mr. Lonely. That's Mr. Lonely. Yeah, is a different. And I I didn't care for either of the well any of those of those three. And uh, I did like Spring Breakers, but. Um, yeah, I get it. I get it. And yes, the the um, the drag aspect of it uh, surprised me. Like it's, I mean, it's amazing to see it. I, I got to figure out how long it's been, but twelve years later, and go, mm. oh, like it, like that stuff just didn't didn't uh, resonate with me that way back then, and just just how alive that is. Um, uh, you know how alive. Uh, our sort of discussions of d- d- depictions of people that aren't ourselves uh, are, are and all the sort of prejudices flying around right now. It's, it's, it's funny. I, I find uh, even though there's a lot of judgment flying around within the content of the film, I weirdly find it uh, not that, but I really, I weirdly find it loving, you know, like I find it, it's, uh, it's, it, it it's, I don't know. It's like it's putting the gaze onto something that that the rest of the world isn't. And it's saying, you know, I care about 
this too. I care about these people too. I care about people that are behaving differently than we're used to too. And, uh, and for me, it's a celebration of that, you know, and, um, and again, like loving, you know, even loving in the savagery and, uh, and loving in the, the messed up, uh, racism of some of those characters and, you know, uh, all that just sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's so, it, it, it's so funny. It's so funny, uh, where, where we sit on these things. And also to me, you know, for me rewatching it and going, Oh God, I don't like, it was shocking. I mean, I reached out to you, I messaged you on Twitter, I would say 25 minutes in or 20 minutes in, which the realization was, had happened 15 minutes before. I'm like, <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I like this anymore. I don't think this for sure is not my favorite movie crisis now where I was like, I was like, oh my God, do I not have a favorite movie anymore? That that felt like a panicking realization. I was like, oh, oh no, I have to have one. Like it was always lovely to have that that movie there as that. And I and I also loved, of course, and there's all sorts of identity baloney mix up in this. I loved saying to people, gummo, and they're like, What? What the hell is that? <laughs> or gummo, and they're like, Are you kidding me? I hate that piece of shit. You know, and I'm like, Yeah, well, I love it. Um, uh, but it was amazing to sit there and go through it and, and feel it so differently, um, feel enormous affection for the, the pieces, all the pieces that I remember. And it's all on people's faces, really. Like, just like, oh, like how beautiful or, oh, I forgot that song, forgot, but remembered. Um, so sort of like visiting home or something like that, but feeling detached, uh, from it, feeling unaffected questioning my love for it judging it at times um very interesting to have that go i mean i wish i would wish i could have a conversation with you know myself 15 years ago um yeah well this is like this is what's so fascinating to me take me through it when did it when did it hit what was your feeling was there a moment where you realized it wasn't working for you or was it just kind of a slide into not like uh, it? well it's mixed i'm bouncing back and forth as i'm watching i knew I knew I sat there and I went, huh, I wonder, I know the cat killing is so, you know, such a part of the, the narrative. And that's not something I would, I would watch. We, we have two cats here right now that I'm madly in love with. I did not have cats in my life back then, but I wasn't like, I wasn't casual about that kind of violence towards animals and all that, but which I think he is decorous about, you know, how he depicts that. Um, so I had I had sat there and beforehand and gone, huh, I wonder if that's going to feel different uh, for me as such a sort of cat lover now. But mm. I don't know. There was just something there, something along the way where where it just felt um, some of the sort of haphazardness of it, which, of course, is almost ludicrous of me to level at it because it is very purposefully so. Like, it's such a you know, feature montage at times, you know, and, um, but just, just, just feeling that questioning the inclusion of certain things, loving the inclusion of some, you know, I think when you get to the two brothers, um, I want to say famously beating the crap out of each other, but you just feel the, the nothingness of it. The, the camera is on us. The camera's waiting. Hey guys, do something harmony perhaps behind there going like yeah like you know what what is it i know he's said in interviews that oh yeah no that's what those guys always do i believe that too that there's no there's no shock in their faces as they start really pounding each other um and you know there's a sense to that there's a there's i still find something beautiful in that where it's like what do i do the camera's on me what do i do and you feel that many times through the movie right everything from the chair fight in the kitchen, um, the sort of expectation that having the camera there is creating and is just sort of waiting. Well, okay, guys, do something, do something, do something. Um, that I love that, but there's there's places where I think that possibly started my sort of uh, detachment uh, from from the movie. And I and and you know, and I'm a and I'm a different person now. Am I? Am I? Um, would would you know 15 20 years ago me feel like i'm super square now i don't i don't know i don't 
think so. I, I'm sure I would love leveling that at myself um, back then, but um, yeah, I don't, I, 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 I don't know. And it's just not, it's not, um, I think there was like a, just a raw connection when I was younger. And I think that's fizzled. I, I, I think there would, there would be something else. I mean, I wonder with more experimental work, like I haven't seen Le Jete and, you know, probably 10 years that thing is just burns me to my soul in the best way would that feel different would those would some of those images have exhausted i know they have a more um, traditional beauty and uh to them but i wonder if that's something that can fade you know uh i don't know i don't know Hey, it's Norm interrupting my own show to bring you up to speed on Shiny Things, my twice-weekly newsletter about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming project. Last week, I wrote about the Blu-ray releases of Living in After Sun and Warner's new 4K box of the Christopher Reeve Superman films, which hold a very special place in my heart. Sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io or find a link at the Simcast Twitter account. Look, this is what I care about. Come check it out. I guess that's the perpetual question, right? Uh, John Harkness always said that The Rules of the Game was his favorite film because every time he went back to it, he would identify and sympathize with a different character. Mm. Even if he even if he was sure it would be this one this time, it would just slowly point out to him that his perspective had changed. Okay. And I was just having a conversation with somebody the other day about how we don't truly appreciate you know, people people always say that cinema is different from other artworks because it moves and it's alive, but it's just as fixed. I mean, unless it's George Lucas tinkering with the Star Wars or Ridley Scott refusing to be done with Alien or something, the movies are the movies that they were whenever they were made. It is mm-hmm. still the audience that changes. Mm-hmm. And we bring something new. You bring all the additional experience that you have. You bring your appreciation of the movie. You bring your understanding of the narrative beats. I mean, you can never see a movie that you've already seen for the first time again, which is Mm -hmm. obvious and dumb, but also it makes bad movies aren't as bad the second time because you know you won't be disappointed. Good movies can be better because the part of your brain that's waiting for it to go wrong knows that it's going to be okay. Everything is new and different in a completely um, unconscious way, even though the film itself is the same. Yeah, And, you know, every time I go... Every time I watch Jaws again, I catch some other tiny detail about, you know, the working class conflict or the um, or the fact that there is, I think there's one black person in the entire movie and it's just someone getting off the ferry. And wow. it's just the things that, you know, it's absolutely representative of what it was like to be on Martha's Vineyard in 1975. Yep. And there's not, it's not that there's nothing wrong with that. It's that now it it's the same, but we are noticing things that we maybe wouldn't have noticed before. Certainly, I mean, yeah. when I was nine, I didn't catch that stuff. But now, you can't not notice it, the the, the sort of pervasive whiteness of, of my favorite movie. Yeah. Um, and Corinne is doing something about spectacle because everything is, is supposed to provoke or offend. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that way, when the tenderness of Solomon and his mom slips in and you get to you get this moment of the rubber band in your brain snapping back that's like holy shit that's linda manns from days of heaven yep and you just sit there in awe for a second that Mm -hmm. a he convinced this person to do this thing Mm -hmm. and b she's not condescending to the material in a way that she perhaps might have or that another veteran might have done like it's not a bit and it's not stunt casting he just really wanted this person to play this part and she was willing to do it and she contains all of this lyrical history in in her presence, which he's clearly conscious of, but not exploiting, which I find fascinating. I mean, that's the thing that I still think about now is the, the ways in which the film is in conversation with masterpieces of Americana that Mm -hmm. it has no resemblance to. And, you know, it's like, even the locations are sort of similar. They're out in the middle of nowhere and these are isolated lives and people without a lot of money and resources. But, you know, Days of Heaven and, and Gummo, other than the fact that they both have Lindemans in them, they, they would not 
you know, they'd cross the street to avoid each other. Yes, yes. Well, that's, I mean, the the Linda Mans thing is, is a very interesting one because you also go through, do we not? And now I feel like like talking about semiotics and, you know, just the, the ways in which we view things, but you can't, I can't help even now, like how many times have I seen it? I guess we're at five or six now. But in that moment when she starts, when I sit there and I go, and it's not like I, I grew up on her, but I was aware of her and I knew what a what a coup or if you want, this is really patronizing, but like a rescue or something like that, mm. that was of her. Like you sit there and you're looking at her, like I think her career had disappeared and, and you're looking at her. And so I'm doing all this stuff of kind of what you've described. You're like, wow. So she's in this, what is she doing here? What's changed with her? Oh, wow. I haven't seen her since she was that much younger. Now she's, she's aged. Isn't that beautiful? Like, and, and, and how, you know, how confident is she in this moment? I'm asking myself as I'm watching it, you know, how comfortable is she? Um, Is she condescending to the material? Does she think it's ridiculous? I don't think so. I think she's really embracing it. And there's just like that, just that beautiful, easy interchange between those two, two uh, actors. And so well, and I guess it's the not acting of it that I feel like I really enjoy sort of leaping into where you're you're like there's there's, you know, as he is obsessed with and talks about endlessly in interviews, you know, there is that sort of beauty of the raw, pure person, um, even when it sometimes fails, which is also interesting with the um, with the joke telling uh, lead who is you know, God bless him, but often not the best actor in, in that moment. Um, and uncomfortable and you feel the author behind it. Like clearly that actor is not riffing off of old vaudeville vibe jokes and things like that. Yeah. He, he's, 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 a, at times a puppet in those moments. And, but, but then I'm also sitting there going, but I love that. I love the, the, the ways in which it doesn't work. Because I'm seeing this guy struggle with something that he doesn't identify with, and and I feel his naked failure in it, and I'm and I and and I like that, and I you know I often think about that like bad performances. I mean, I've often thought of um, uh, Keanu Reeves, River Phoenix. Um, oh, my own private Idaho. My my own private Idaho. Like I've often thought about. Uh, you know that performance by Keanu Reeves, who I I love. There's a there's a way in which, for me, he's not he's not good at um, the language. Like when they and it's awkward when they when they, you know, flip into anything that feels Shakespearean. Right. He is the person who feels most um, hindered by it, if you will. And I've I've, I've often you know, or back when I used to watch it a lot, I often thought about that, and I thought, oh, this is this is genius. Like, this is like, it works so well for the, the Henry, Henry V of it all, the Hal character that he's not good at this. Like he doesn't, he wrestles with, you know, not be, not being able to live up to that image. And I'm, it's a moment where I've been like, Oh, like if you had someone who was ferocious and tore it apart, it would, it wouldn't be for me as good. And I'm like, am I making excuses for a piece of casting that doesn't, apart from the, the great looks of it, doesn't land? And, you know, I can I can do the same here with Gummo, where I'm like, oh, there's something about this that takes us to, again, uh, a realness that works for the for the picture. I don't I don't know. And the question, I guess, is that it then becomes whether Corinne is good with actors or even tries. Right. I mean, does he cast people for who they are and then just use them that way? Or does he actually work with his cast to shape their performances? I don't know that either is a slight in in his mm-hmm. case for the movies he makes, because Spring Breakers is just anarchy. And I don't think there's any coaching, but I think it's his strongest film because you're getting this pure id coming out of everybody where they're obviously, whether they, I mean, there's some... I'm I'm stepping on my own point. There's obviously some agency in his direction because they are all on the same page, right? Like they're yep. matching the energy that the film needs. Yeah. But they're also stepping on each other's lines and bumping into things and just generally being chaotic. And it feels like he's not even there sometimes, which I think is the thing he's going for. Mm-hmm. But in his other films, he's so present that it becomes oppressive. That yeah. you know, like we need he needs me to know how he feels about these shots and and these people. And it's nihilistic and contemptuous. 
and I'm not into that. Yeah, well, and this we will have to agree to disagree. For me, it isn't sure. nihilistic or con contemptuous. To, for me, it's, it's how great is it, how different we feel about it. For me, it's loving. But uh, uh, but uh, I, I got to process my um, my detachment from from the movie now. And I, I think you, you know, I think, don't though. You can be honest and and have those things fighting in you the the, I, the former I, love and the and the past the like the past affection in the present day distance yeah yeah they yep they are they do li live in me like it's interesting when we start talking about it and you say you ask me uh you know what did i love about it back then i'm almost convincing myself that it's, <laughs> that it's the greatest again and yeah. uh i mean i wonder and even just sort of scrolling through it a little bit before we talk i'm like oh yeah i love that i love that i love that i love that just like just you know and so much of that is images but also knowing what someone is singing or or whatever through that um yeah it's uh it, it's it's interesting i don't know you know <laughs> i don't know what i what i do with that and it may be nothing and that's fine and but now i need to find a new favorite film <laughs> i think about a conversation i had geez 10 years ago at least now well yeah 12 2012 with ryan johnson about looper Ooh. and how his entire film was motivated by the idea of meeting your younger self and being disgusted by how little you've learned. Oh, well. And when I asked him to clarify that, he said it goes in either direction. Like you can be older and disgusted that this is your promise that you've wasted, or you can be older and disgusted that you never had promised to begin with and you didn't see it as a kid because you just had no self-awareness. Yeah. And that's like that's this conversation that's this experience for you you have you are processing this movie through your own memories of yourself mm -hmm. processing this movie right like it's a it's a yep. it's not quite an ouroboros because you've come out another side of it but but when you do experience something again you re-encounter yourself as much as you re-encounter the, the piece of culture that you're experiencing right like the you can never step in the same river twice but you can stand in front of the mona lisa twice yeah yeah no, I love I I love that. I love the yeah, I love the 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 challenge of that or, or the the nakedness of it, you know? Like the the yeah, the who the the who was I, who am I? I mean I mean it's interesting in to think of Johnson's you know the the latter the latter thing he said where he uh talked about you know no uh, discovering that you have no promise and not being able to recognize that when you're younger which is just horrifying I'd, I'd love to write a movie about that right now <laughs> um but uh but you know that that's that's interesting when i last moved um i had a million emails that i printed off because i'd killed an account and so so it was emails of myself and all my friends and exes and all that kind of stuff and I made myself read them all to keep them. And I was astounded again and again and again by, so a lot of these were like, I don't know, probably actually around when I was watching this movie, everyone was so much brighter and self-aware than I thought they were. Um, like looking back, I thought, I think, I think now I'm like, oh God, all the stuff, all the therapy, all the, all the deep thinking, all the, all this stuff, it's led to, oh, we're so much more you know, not elevated, but uh, so much more aware and, mm -hmm. and connected and all that kind of stuff. But when I read, in, and it was across the board, when I read myself and all my friends' emails, I was like, oh my God, we're so, we're, we were so aware then. Like at what, like what sort of older arrogance is there that I think we were idiots stumbling, uh, stumbling around? Um, and it, and it was widespread enough that I was like, oh, this is just not, this is not luck. It's not that I had the smartest, most self-aware friends. I would assume and hope that most people would, would encounter this. Um, anyway, so I, you know, I don't know what that points to. Maybe it just points to my older, you know, prejudice of, uh, about all of us or my deep desire, this is real for sure, to think that we are progressing, right? That we are, and I, and I still think we are, but I'm like, it's sure as hell not as uh, enormous as I am, would imagine or desire. Yeah, I get it. I understand exactly what you, you're saying. I think back on myself and remember, I mean, we're all just sort of bluffing at playing adults anyway. 
Mm -hmm. And I think we get better at it as we get older. And then we meet people who are so much younger than us that it is impossible to pretend that we're not grownups, mm. even though, you know, we're still idiots. We're still a collection of impulses and hormones and, and mm -hmm. half-baked ideas. And, and nobody should trust me with anything, you know, heavier than a fork. And it's something that never goes away if you work on yourself. Right. Like that's, I think that's what it is. It's the difference between, and this is probably the most pompous thing I will ever say. Uh, it's the difference between understanding that you are unfinished and never will be finished. You will die. Like it'll be over for me one day, but I'm hopefully we'll still have some stuff I'd like to get, make myself better at. Yeah. Um, and there are people, uh, a dear friend of mine once explained that the worst people in the world are the ones who peak in high school because they think they never have to try and you can see them in the world. Yeah. And if you were one of those people who didn't peak in high school and just wasn't totally sure about who you were or where you belonged or what you wanted to do, you never lose it because you go into the world and you see a whole bunch of other people who also don't know. And those are the people that you like. And every yes. now and then one of the high school people will show up and you're just like, Oh God, no, no, yeah. that's yeah. what happens yeah. when you stop trying. Yeah. And it makes you feel better about yourself and it makes you feel better about your friend group and all the people that you've chosen to be around as an adult. But those people who don't have to try either become like calcified into sociopaths, uh, like convinced that they'll, they're still the, the, the head mean girl or mean guy or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they will continue to show up in your life. Not the same people from high school, but the same type. And for the rest of your life, that's where imposter syndrome comes from. Because mm -hmm. these people think they have it together and, and status and all these other things. And it's sort of mixed up in watching something now that you used to love. And it's sort of mixed up in all of Corinne's filmmaking as well. Well, that's a two-parter. You're so mm -hmm. right about the first part, like the watching a film you 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 used to love, especially with a 15 year or however long it's been absent uh, absence. But yeah, that is that that is you're 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 stumbling upon yourself in a in a weird way and trying to understand what's happened and 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 how you've changed. And I, and I think too the fervor with which I loved it definitely makes it like a deeply personal thing rather than just going like, Oh, this isn't as good as I remember. Um, and, and the ways in which it's, it's behind Corinne. Yeah, I guess you're right. Like there's a, like you feel it with, uh, with Julian, you feel it with the, the movie that came after not trash humpers. Uh, um, the one we we couldn't remember the, the, Mr. Lonely? yeah. Yeah. You feel like that's, I mean, well, that's, and there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a, there's a hunt, which I feel like is very present these days for, about authenticity, which I guess Corinne back then would have, you know, been talking about realness or something like that, that, mm. that is an obsession, right? You know, a, a guy that wants to work in, um, you know, a medium that at times is about not realness and, but chase the realness in it. Like, you know, maybe that's that, that sort of war in him. Hell, maybe that's similar to what I'm going through, uh, right now. Um, and, and, you know, too, I would say actually when I saw it, I don't know, I was, I was writing and directing theater. So I, but, but I sort of, I wonder if it's like also a difference. It's just like, you know, how, how much I'm making TV and movies right now as to, how much I wanted to at, at that moment. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. All of that is, and what you've said is so, is so interesting. It's something that I've never reconciled myself to, I guess, because, you know, everybody's afraid of watching a movie that they loved years and years ago because it might not hold up or it might yeah. be cancelable or there might be something in it. And, and there's things in Gummo that I'm pretty sure he would be pilloried for now. Oh, yeah. uh, certainly the dead cat imagery and, and the, that final shot where he really is just aesthetically rubbing it in the audience's face, right? That he's done this, that he's made this movie. And I get that. And that feels honest to me. Mm -hmm. um, I still don't like it, but it's, <laughs> but it's hard to, I don't know, maybe. And, and I've certainly noticed that I, as I've gotten older, I have, I found myself working harder to find the, the animating 
ideas or the reason that people made a movie, mm-hmm. even if it's something that is purely commercial. You know, nobody, I, I do believe nobody sets out to make bad stuff. Yeah, there are people yeah. who set out to make money and they don't care about how they do it. You know, like they'll yeah. make a, they'll they'll do cash in films or, or ride whatever trend is happening at the moment. And it it feels like Corinne seized a moment where suddenly he was getting offers to make movies that he could not have made before kids happened, right? Like mm-hmm. he's in that point where New Line offers him a deal and he takes it because of course he does. And he he yeah. tells the story because he wants to, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I still don't connect to it, but given the subsequent 20 years of his career, I mean, yes, he's he's got a thing. Like he's telling the sorts of stories he wants to tell. Yep. And as he's grown out of the need to shock and kind of tilted into a more surrealistic, uh, stylized direction. You know, the thing I like about the Spring Breakers and to a lesser extent about Mr. Lonely is that it doesn't pretend for a second to be realist. And uh-huh. he creates environments that he can tell his stories in. And those, the same stories that are all about power and connection and people who have nothing coming together for something. Um, or people with insane, with an insane amount of privilege as in spring breakers, just wasting Mm it, Mm -hmm. um, and squandering the possibility of connection, but he's doing something that, that lines up over a years and, and that lines up over the decades. And I kind of respect him for not veering from the path, even though it's not a path I particularly want to walk with. Yeah. I, I, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I dare say I like, I identify with it, you know, as a guy that was, you know, what was he, was he 19 when he made, uh, when he wrote Kids, Gummo? Yeah. He's, oh, he's, oh, sorry. Okay. He's 50 now. So, oh, let's see. Maybe I may be wrong about that. He may have been, uh, yeah. Born in 1973. So he would have been. Glad you were 20. Out. Yeah. 25, 26, 20, 24. He was 24, 24 when it came out. Okay. When it came out. So let's say he was shooting when he was 23. Yeah. I mean, like, and, and when I think about some of the, the, the work I was making, you know, in those years uh, with a theater company in Toronto called Theater Viscera, we, which was just sort of, it was, we were chasing that sort of liminal on the edge sort of stuff and doing, you know, my, the theater version of similar work. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, and it's, interesting for me that you know yeah spring breakers clicks with me so much uh so much more now enough so that it becomes you know an influence on season three of slasher when i am now doing much more um rigidly uh narrative linear um traditional sort of mainstream work i mean I, I you know at that time at his age when i was doing theater the notion that i would work in tv i mean i just i didn't even watch tv i was i looked to me it was pure garbage and mm-hmm. and i was a festival kid seeing gorging myself on hong kong and iranian cinema and don't talk to me about mainstream anything uh, because and I and I guess the, that's part of it too, right? That appeal is someone opens a door, just like that moment for me of seeing Blue Velvet, where you're like, "What? Like this exists? How 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 can all this be here?" And I never knew, and people have hidden it from me. You know, it's 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 that moment where you find your your people, your art, your all of that. Yeah, it's this exists, but it's also this exists, and I can use it to communicate as well. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's the language that you're introduced to. And mm-hmm. I would certainly say that slasher is a subversion of the genre that it's playing with. Like it's not, I mean, it is mainstream because genre has become mainstream, but what you guys are yeah. doing in that show is it's really fun, but it's also uh, kind of consciously perverse, right? You're yep. playing with expectations and with form. And I don't see anything that pulls straight out of Gummo, but it does feel like, you know, that aesthetic that Corinne's worlds are maybe not too far away from a couple of the seasons that you've done. I, I, yeah, I, I could I could imagine people that, that some of the things people level at season three and four when I became involved, some of the focus on some of the focus on gore, like, of course, hmm. the camera is going to the camera will not look away. 
this is great credit to Adam McDonald as a director, but you know, it's what we're chasing um, with, you know, the, with the show. I mean, there, 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 there's, there's a, there's a death in season four that I think about where someone is essentially quartered like with a machine while everyone that loves them is running in trying to stop this. And the camera shows all of it, every last minute of it. And it's, and it's, um, it's unrelenting and you feel, you know, the mother is watching as her son is torn apart and she can't stop it. And he is torn apart and he can't stop it. And there's the horror of everyone else realizing that's coming for them. And, and I can see, I, I definitely heard from people that, that esteemed what we were doing that were like, you didn't have to show that. And I would disagree um for that season i would i would say no we absolutely had had to because we had to show what was happening to everyone else and how they were reacting to it and then we had a you know we had a scene in the next episode which we had the worst day when we were shooting this thing and people were like we can't shoot the next scene we can't shoot the next scene i was like we have to the, the next scene is our show and the next scene was it's all over the guy is dead how is everyone else doing and this to me is a place where slasher lives where a lot of other horror doesn't necessarily we we sit in the pain and grief of what has happened and it's the great thing about tv rather than horror movies necessarily is you fall in love with people and you have such a deep relationship with them and so we 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 had we had to go there and I, and i think uh I, I think there's an aspect of that that is a little corinne you know, uh, from, from that movie, but, but horror as well, of course, horror looks at the things we don't want to look at. And, um, and that was obvious when we were working with Cronenberg in that season, you know, his, his appreciation for what we were doing and the conclusion of season four is a scavenger hunt in his body, mm. you know, that goes to, there's a key moment that goes to his colon for crying out loud, you know, and you're like, you're like, where else can we go? Like I did feel like we've topped it. Like it's just like um that's done. But that's of that's a if Corinne did horror, probably he would have a scavenger hunt that ended in someone's colon. Yeah, I mean he's about wreckage, right? Like he's about the people in the ruins. Mm -hmm. And as you say, horrors, I mean, you know, Jamie Lee could just so famously said it's about trauma, but it is so much about helping the audience to understand the traumas that we yep. see on the screen. I just, I'm all, and, and yeah, I, I have to say like how much, how lucky are you guys to have Cronenberg for a season? He's, I am, I am almost sorry now that he's making movies again as a director because his little career as an actor has been so great. This little blip in his, in his uh, CV where suddenly he's a semi-regular on Star Trek and just people understand he's aged into such a magnificent face that you can't help it but oh, yeah he's also just so good his timing is yes. amazing yes yeah he was he was incredible and the part was not a little thing it wasn't oh a walk on with a mm -hmm. couple of good lines like it was all through the entire season and there it required a lot of him a lot like it was super nuanced and and uh he crushed it and yeah i i feel i feel the same way heck i feel that way about adam mcdonald our director who i think is so gifted and one of the best directors in horror period adam is a spectacular always original actor mm -hmm. and you know we've thrown him on the show in like these tiny tiny pieces and i'm just like oh my god i want to write so much more for that person and going back to cronenberg have you read his novel i have it's, yeah Consumed. I, lo I love that I love that novel so much. And I, and you know, he's, he's massive for me. Videodrome, as I said to David, when I reached out to him in a letter is, you know, maybe the movie I've watched second most in my life. And it was as a, as a student at U of T hearing that I'd had a similar trajectory, a trajectory spelled out that I wanted to adhere to that, that he did. Um, that movie was just, you know, I just couldn't believe it. It felt illegal. And well, it's similar. It's similar to the blue velvet of it. It's similar yeah, to the yeah. gum of it. I'm like, what? This exists. This is me somewhere in here. Um, uh, anyway, I was astounded to read his novel and then say to him, like, I, I can't believe it, but I think I like this more than almost all your movies. Like, you know, like, it's just so so good so it's it's so assured it's not it's not the work of a filmmaker who's sort of dabbling off to the side it's he he could have been an amazing novelist 
you know, for decades. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's annoying when someone is that good at everything they do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My thanks to Ian Carpenter, whose new film Mary F. Kill is now streaming on Tubi in the U.S. and Crave in Canada. And don't miss out on Slasher Ripper, which is splattering across Shudder around the world. New episodes every Thursday. You can find Ian on Twitter at underscore Ian Carpenter. And while you can't find Gummo streaming anywhere, the old New Line DVD is still kicking around, so check out the used bins. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhip.com slash Semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 44 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get your booster when you can. I'll see you next week. <laughs>